So as Mark said, I'm Andrew Chow, and today I'm going to be talking about BIP-174, partially signed Bitcoin transactions, uh, also known as PSBT. So today I'm going to be talking about a bit, a bit about uh, why we need uh, PSBTs, or partially signed Bitcoin transactions, uh, what they are, and the actual form of the transaction itself, and how to use a PSBT and the workflows around that. So, uh, a quick story. Uh, around this time last year, there was a fork of Bitcoin, and there was I had some fork coins on a ledger, or not a ledger, it was a treasure. And I wanted to get these four coins off my treasure so I could sell them, obviously. And I wanted to do this locally and securely, so I was going to use Bitcoin Core and Electrum. So I figured this would be easy. It would be a pretty standard process that you do for signing offline transactions in, uh, with Bitcoin Core. You just create a raw transaction, bring it to Electrum, sign it using the Electrum Trezor plugin, bring it back to Core, and broadcast it to the network. So I went to do this, and I created a raw transaction, brought it to Electrum, and I saw this problem. It says that the transaction doesn't belong to my Electrum wallet. What? Stand up. <sighs> you broke it. Back. Hey, it's back. All right, so, so back to this story. Uh, Electrum says this transaction was not related to my wallet. It definitely was. I assure you this transaction was related to my wallet. And it also says the transaction is signed, but uh, according to Core, that's definitely not signed. The script sig is completely empty. So I spent a long time trying to figure this out, many hours, reading through some documentation that wasn't very clear, and reverse engineering Electrum's transaction format. And I finally figured out what the problem was. <coughs> Bitcoin Core will create a transaction that does not have anything in the script sig, uh, in the input scripts. But Electrum, Electrum expects to see things in these input scripts. It actually expects to see public keys. Uh, and that's how it ident identifies whether a transaction is, uh, it's, is in that wallet so that it can sign. But obviously the transaction I gave I gave it from Core, did not have this information. And the result was that Electrum and Bitcoin Core were completely incompatible with each other if you try to do raw transactions. And that is really the only way you can even try to interact these two together. So there was this problem, and there was some other problems with doing raw transactions. Uh, for those of you who don't know, raw transactions actually require more data than uh, just the transaction and the private key itself in order to sign that transaction. We need some extra data, like the previous transaction or the, the output script of the outputs that are being spent. We need redeem scripts, and we need to know what keys uh, are being used to sign this transaction. And to do this in Bitcoin Core, you have to provide a bunch of, you have to provide this out of band in the command, and you get a command that looks like this, it's a lot longer when you have many inputs, and it's hard to get right, and it's hard for uh, relatively new users to even know how to do this and get it correct. So in this example, you'll see... Users too. <laughs> yes. People who wrote the software too. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I, make the, I make a lot of JSON errors a lot. But uh, you can see in uh, highlighted, that's the extra data that we have to provide. It's the previous transaction, the script pub key, which is the output script, uh, in the amount, and if this was P2SH, we'd also have to provide the redeem script. So this was a, I found this to be a problem, is annoying to take things across wallets, and we obviously need more data than just these raw transactions. So I decided I was going to create yet another standard. <laughs> now, this is not quite just another standard. It's actually, I would say, the first standard for uh, having a transaction format that contains everything that's needed for signing. This is actually well specified, unlike the current formats that are used, and it solves the problem of 
the incompatibility because it's a standard, obviously. And it's also actually being used by some other software already. So of course, this standard is partially signed Bitcoin transactions. So some information about the format itself. Um, the, the transaction is for partially, uh, what we call partially signed, which may be a misnomer if we include Schnorr signatures in this, but let's ignore that for now. Uh, so what I mean by partially signed is that a tra the transaction, what we call fully signed, is something that if you broadcast it to the Bitcoin network, it would be immediately accepted by the network, uh, ignoring lock time. But, and so this means that the transaction is fully signed because it has a full set of signatures in all of its inputs. So partially signed is everything up until that fully signed state. It doesn't have, not all the inputs have all their signatures. They may, they may even have no signatures at all. And that would, and if none of them have their signatures, that's unsigned, which I consider still to be part of this partially signed state. So the partially signed Bitcoin transactions uh, is for the state where the transactions are not fully signed yet. And so these transactions consist of the raw transaction, uh, a raw unsigned transaction itself, followed by metadata for each input and output. Uh, and so this data is everything that is needed to sign. <coughs> uh, it's everything needed to know what you are signing is actually what you intend to sign. It's everything that you need to know in order to sign the transaction. It's also everything that you need to know in order to construct the final transaction at the end when you have all of these signatures. Of course, this doesn't include the private keys because that would be kind of pointless. So the, the format also holds all of these signatures as is indicated by this partially signed name. And I've also designed it to be easily extensible so that we can extend it in the future in order to uh, support new things such as Schnorr signatures. So this transaction format, we can visualize it in a bit of a diagram like this. We have some header bytes uh, that are just magic bytes. We have this unsigned transaction, which is actually part of a set of global data. Uh, and if we look into this unsigned transaction a bit, uh, we also notice that the unsigned transaction has a header a list of inputs and a list of outputs. And the inputs in this unsigned transaction map directly to inputs in our PSBT. As you can see we have our input in the unsigned transaction maps to an input in our PSBT that just comes after our global data. And we do this for every input and every output. So we end up with a list, our global data, which has our unsigned transaction, followed by a list of inputs and all the metadata associated with those inputs, and then a list of outputs and all the metadata associated with those outputs. <clears throat> and if we dive a bit, uh, I forgot that slide. <laughs> if we dive a bit deeper, we have uh, the actual format uh, on a very low level is a set of typed key value pairs. Um, and we have the map, we have the set of globals, which we can really call a map, it's just a key, a key value pairs, or it's a map or a dictionary. So we have the map for the globals, and then a list of maps for the inputs, and a list of maps for the outputs. Uh, writing this as a struct, we get, you know, transaction, list of inputs, list of outputs, and we also have some unknown things that I'll get to later. So for our inputs, the data we include in the input is uh, the UTXO uh, of the, uh, the output that we're spending, the SIG hash type that we want to sign with, um, scripts, or redeem scripts, signatures themselves, uh, public keys and their BIP32 derivation paths uh, for this input, the final script SIG, and also a few unknowns. There are actually SegWit variants for the UTXO the final script SIG and the, the redeem script because SegWit has some slightly different semantics. And for our outputs, we have uh, the redeem, redeem script necessary to spend the output and public keys necessary to spend the output. So the reason we actually have the outputs is so that we can verify that uh, 
the co where we are sending the coins is what we actually intend to send the coins to. So we can check if, say, we're sending to a multi-sig that you know, we're actually sending to a multi-sig with the people we thought the multi-sig is part of. It's also useful for identifying our own change. And so for these unknown things, those unknown things are so that we can easily extend the PSBT in the future. Uh, because PSBT is a set of typed key value pairs, we can add new types for new key value pairs. Uh, and the unknowns that we have is because we can view a set of key value pairs as a map, we just have a map of key and value, keys to values of un things that when we deserialize, we don't know what their type is. And so not everything needs to understand all the types that are available. Uh, you can ignore some of them and still pop, uh, understand it. And even some roles that we'll get to later uh, don't have to understand types at all. So a signer also doesn't need to understand some types because they can still produce a valid signature using the information that they know. And at worst, the signature will just be invalid and you can't use it. And so those are the unknowns highlighted for each of the different scopes. <coughs> so here's an example using a three of three multisig. For those of you who don't know what three of three is, it's, uh, you have three people and all three of them must sign the transaction in order, to, in order for it to be valid. So let's say in our three of three, we've got Alice, Bob, and Carol, which uh, in my slides will they will be color-coded. Alice is uh, red, Bob is gray, and Carol is green. So let's say Alice wants to make a transaction. So she'll talk to Bob and Carol and figure out what inputs to, to spend and what outputs they want to create. And she will create a PSBT. This will be completely blank. It just has the raw unsigned transaction and empty maps for the inputs and the outputs. Then uh, Alice, say, uh, she has a node, but her wallet doesn't know uh, all the redeem scripts or public keys for the inputs, but she has a node, so she will add the UTXO information to this PSBT. Uh, and then, because she can't do anything else with this, she's going to give it to Bob. And Bob has the uh, scripts and key information. So Bob was going to add these scripts and keys to the PSBT. So now all the inputs have all, all the information needed to sign. It has the UTXOs, it has the keys, the public keys, and it has the scripts. So Bob sends this PSBT to Alice and Carol, and Alice and Carol are going to sign this transaction using the information provided. And if, say, Carol has like an offline signer, she can take the PSBT uh, as it is, straight off her online computer to the offline signer, and sign it there without having to add any extra information. And she can bring it back, and it, the, the PSBT she brings back will have her signature inside of it. So once Alice, Bob, and Carol have signed the PSBT, um, and say Carol is going to be the one that broadcasts, so they all send their PSBTs to Carol. And Carol is going to combine the PSBTs together into one new one that has all of the signatures that Alice and Bob and Carol created. This combined PSBT then will be used to construct those final script SIGs using the signatures and the keys provided. Uh, Carol can produce the final script SIG that will go into the network transaction. And lastly, Carol is going to use those final script SIGs and make that final transaction and then broadcast it to the network. And so all of this is done with PSBT and various software. Uh, Alice, Bob, and Carol didn't really have to input anything extra except their private keys, and usually the wallet software handles your private keys for you anyways. And so this can be broken down into different roles, uh, and these are defined in BIP 174. And as a note, side note, these multiple roles don't have to be, don't have to act independent, independent of each other. They can be implemented in software as, or multiple roles can be implemented by, in one entity in the software. So in this example, uh, our first role is the creator. And in this case, the creator was Alice because she created the transaction, obviously. The next role is the updater. And in this case, this was both Alice and Bob because they updated the tr transaction 
with new information. They update it with the metadata needed to sign. And so the updater, it could be split like this. Uh, you can have multiple updates. It'll just be one person that happens to know everything. Then we have signers who sign the transaction. And this was Alice, Bob, and Carol. They all perform signing. And then we have the combiner, which was Carol. Uh, the combiner is very simple. It actually, as I mentioned earlier, the combiner doesn't need to understand all the types. It just needs to merge all the maps together and make sure there aren't anything, or there aren't any duplicates. You can just shove everything back together. Then we have the finalizer, which produces the final script SIGs uh, that will eventually go into the final transaction. And we have the extractor, who takes those final script SIGs and, ex and produces the uh, final transaction, and it kind of looks like it's extracting the transaction out of the PSPT. And the extractor is also the one who will likely broadcast the transaction to the network. So there are other use cases uh, besides multi-sig. We can use this for coin join, we can use it for harbor wallets, and we can use it for offline wallets, as I mentioned earlier. So I'll actually go through an example using coin join because this shows how you can use this without everyone having to update their inputs uh, for everyone else. So for those of you who don't know, a coin join is where uh, multiple people participate in the same transaction. So the inputs of the transaction come from multiple different people. So in the first step of the coin join, you're going to do some coin join protocol. This could be like join market, coin shuffle, or zero link, but somehow some protocol happens where everyone figures out what inputs and what outputs they're going to use in, in their transaction. Uh, then whoever's coordinating that coin join, let's say in this case it's Alice again, uh, she's going to use the information from the coin join protocol to create a PSBT. Uh, once she creates it, uh, uh, she's going to send this PSBT to Bob and Carol. It's going to actually be blank, they have no information on it, and Bob and Carol, uh, Alice, Bob, and Carol are actually all going to update their update their PSBT separately with their own UTXO information and their own key and script information, and then they're also going to sign it themselves. So in this example, Alice, Bob, and Carol don't actually see the input information from the other participants in this coin join. But using PSBT, if one of them has a hardware wallet or an offline signer, after they update the, the PSBT, they can take it to their offline signer sign it there and bring it back without having to enter any additional information. Once it's assigned, then let's say they'll send it all to uh, Alice again, and Alice is going to combine, combine everything. Uh, once Alice combines the PSBT, uh, she will also finalize it and then extract it using the same process that I described earlier. And eventually the, the transaction is broadcast by Alice to the Bitcoin network. So lastly, go to where can we use PSBT? Well, right now, PSBT isn't really in production. But it it's, has been merged into Bitcoin Core 0 0.17, which is going to be released hopefully in September. And there you'll be able to use PSBT with a variety of RPC commands that have been implemented into it. Uh, PSBT has also been implemented into the cold card hardware wallet. Uh, by, created by CoinKite, and they use PSBT natively where its whole communication thing is based around passing back and forth PSBTs from your computer to their hardware wallet. And they currently have a simulator I think they're shipping soon. And of course there will be, there are libraries and other wallets that are implementing uh, PSBT. They've, uh, there are a few libraries and uh, wallets that are in the process or are very close to finishing their implementations of PSBT. So that's it. Any questions?
All right, we're going to take <laughs> few, uh, Since Electrum implements their own little thing using Bitcoin transactions that you mentioned before, have you heard any feedback from them if they're planning on supporting this yet? Uh, no, but I know people that are going to implement it into Electrum. Okay. Um, so for transmitting the P PBSTs between, um, whatever, sorry, <laughs> dyslexic, um, between people, um, you're basically like supposing that we use like email or some other like third party communication system. Right. The, the BIP doesn't specify how you're going to get PSBTs to people. It's just describing the format of the transaction to use. So you could use email, um, Maybe it'll be supported in the payment protocol or something. I don't know. Yeah, <laughs> it just seems it would. It seems like it would be really cool to have some sort of like solution for people to communicate yeah. as well. It would. Because you're opening up, opening up the signing process um, from internal to you know between between different entities, there seems like there could be some security impl impl implications. Have you thought about those? Um, so I have thought about that, and the what I eventually figured out was that at worst, you'll make an invalid signature. Uh, the signature won't can't be used for this transaction, and um, it couldn't be used for any other transaction either. And as th this kind of assumes that the signer is doing some sort of sanity checking uh, and that they are making sure that the input they're signing is what they expect it to be and that the outputs are what they expect it to be. Okay, so you mentioned uh, hardware wallets. Um, it's important to have a little footprint of the data that is flowing through the, the memory. How bigger is the uh, footprint of this protocol if compared to the traditional unsigned, unsigned transaction? Um, so the PSPT contains within it the unsigned transaction, so it's going to be larger. And uh, one part I, I didn't mention because it's kind of in the weeds, but uh, for non-segwit outputs, the UTXO that you provide is actually the entirety of the previous transaction. And so this can end up to be very large. Um, which I guess isn't super useful for hardware wallets. However, if you are using SegWit only, with SegWit, we don't provide the full transaction, we only provide the output. And this means that the, if, you, if your transaction is entirely SegWit outputs, it can be uh, pretty compact. So some, something to add to that is, um, we don't really expect to have hardware wallets implement PSBT natively. There, there probably will be some, like the, the CoinKite uh, cold wallet does, but um, hardware wallets already support signing transactions and they already need all that information. They already have protocols to, to do all these things. So um, it, it's more expected that PSBT will be the communication between higher level wallet software and a driver and the driver just speaks the native protocol with the hardware wallet where this as Andy pointed out, this is sometimes a problem, but it is already a problem. It's just encapsulating the, the communication in a different way. This, this might sort of show my ignorance in asking this question, but is the, is the entire transaction all or nothing? Like when Alice recomposes all the signatures, is is it going to include Alice, Bob's, and Carol's transactions and, and not just Alice and Bob's, for example? Um, so, I guess the, the combiner is very dumb and it will just combine. Like, if, if you give it Alice, Bob, and Carol's transactions, the end result is going to be all of those stuck together with duplicate things removed. So is, is Alice signing all three? Or is Alice only So Alice, Alice only signs her, uh, her own, but because it is the same transaction, like the same network transaction for all three, uh, at the end, her signature is valid because it's really just the same thing, but 
spread to three different places, I guess? Uh, I think the confusion here is Alice does commit to the complete transaction, but she only signs her input. So if the transaction has three inputs, um, each of the signers commits to the whole transaction, but signs only one of the three inputs. Does that make more sense? Yeah, could those transactions be broadcast in part? No, they cannot. So someone proposes a transaction that spends three inputs. That is a transaction that everybody is going to sign. And until everybody signs off on that entire transaction with, and it is spending three different keys, so all these keys need to sign off on the entire transaction. And until all of them do, the transaction is not valid. So the transaction is an atomic. So I think Peter was trying to explain, like, the, the, this is the purpose of a coin join is such that everybody commits to the same transaction. Now, if you wanted three separate transactions, you can always have that, and that, that's been there since day one. Um, I think this is really cool, by the way. Uh, and I have a question regarding, like, is it possible to do, like, more complex script types, maybe ones that are non-standard? Um, like, it, it is? Okay, it looks like it. Maybe using the unknown fields or something. Um, um, but it'll be cool like if you don't need the signatures in like regular places so, that we can inject them or something. So actually, that is up to the finalizer. The finalizer needs to fi figure out how to construct the final script sig. We actually figured out you can implement a really dumb signer. Uh, when you sign, the signer only either needs the script pub key or the redeem script. It doesn't even need to know what their contents are or, or like, like how to parse their contents. It just needs to know whether it should sign this input and if it should, what is the script pub key and what is the redeem script? And it can produce a valid signature from there. So if you have a really complex redeem script with like whatever lock times or hash locks, whatever, uh, only the finalizer needs to understand what those are. Uh, the signers don't. Are there any more questions right now? Ah, super. So, uh you said one of the parties, I think either Alice or Bob, were running a node. So is running a full node a requirement for any of the participants, or can they be SPV? Uh, they can be SPV. They just need to know what the UTXOs are. So, And this is general for all transactions. You need to know the UTXOs that you are spending. Otherwise, you can't produce a signature. And the finalizer, can they be another? the not part of the, say, the three-party example, can they be a, a totally different entity that yes. would monitor the network for these kinds of PSP? Well, this, the finalizer doesn't even need to connect to the network. Okay. Uh, it just needs to be able to parse scripts. These, these partially signed Bitcoin transactions aren't transmitted on the network. They're, they're shared between... Like, yeah. So these, these partially signed Bitcoin transactions aren't shared on the public Bitcoin network. They're shared... Uh, between users that are engaging in some protocol, multi-sig, coin join, whatever. And then after they go through the, the finalizer, then they can be extracted and broadcast on the network. So, so you could make your own protocol that exchanges around partially signed transactions using this format as, as what it's communicating, but that's not something that the Bitcoin protocol does. So also, Generally, the, the, the phases it goes through, so and Andy has explained, there's a creator, the updater, the signer, combiners, finalizer, and extractor. Uh, only the updater needs to uh, know about the network. So the, the updater uh, for the proposed transaction, so the creator creates a proposed transaction, the updater, uh, which is generally the, the wallets that are involved and know about or the ones that treat those coins being spent as theirs because they already know how that they are there. So they, they can just add that information to, to the PSBT. And once that is done, nobody needs to communicate with the network at all anymore. It's just operating on the data within the PSBT file and, and then at the end broadcast it. So how does this differ than, than how coin joins are, are currently performed? And, and how does it per, uh, improve upon that? Uh, so coin joins right now, I th th what? well, they don't work. <laughs> uh, 
uh, uh, coin drones right now need, uh, I guess they don't work super well with like hardware and offline wallets. Um, and this kind of helps with that, uh, as it generally helps with hardware and offline wallets. Um, but with, uh, I can't remember what else. All right, Greg, Greg has something to say about this. <laughs> so, so coin joints, multi-sig, hardware wallets, the, all, these are all things that exist today, people use them, but they all have their own custom communication mechanisms that, and so you often can't combine like a multi-sig of two different hardware wallets, good luck with that, right? Or coin join with a hardware wallet, because they all implement something like this partially signed Bitcoin transaction specific to their application, and it's not interoperable. And so what this does is provides a common communication layer where all these sorts of applications can hopefully speak largely the same language. And as a result, we should get some better tools coming out of it at the end. Any more questions? Well, then thank you again, Andrew, for your talk. And